A Zika está chegando no Brasil e nós acabamos de conversar com o Stefan Silaf, o chefe global de design da Zika, responsável por todos os modelos da marca pelo mundo. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. My first question is: How is the main challenge to design uh, cars for entire world, not only China? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I, as you know, have more or less 35 years of. Uh, professional experience, a very, very long time with uh, Volkswagen Group. Therefore, I also know a part of Brazil with uh, Sao Paulo and uh, the design studio that was there from, or still is there from Volkswagen. So I was visiting Brazil also in my function at that time as a global, global uh, design uh, director of, of interior design for the whole Volkswagen Group. Uh, with Luis Vega at that time leading the studio over there. So this experience uh, with the Volkswagen Group, but also with Mercedes uh, holding, uh, where I was working also for three years, uh, acting very, very global, was a good, uh, let's say, um, introduction or a good support for doing this job now within the Chile holding. And when we look especially at the brand Zika, uh, building up a new brand now within the last three years, a uh, luxury or at least, let's say, premium brand that is acting globally. Um, <clears throat> the challenge is, uh, of course, always the same. Uh, and I think the best way to overcome uh, too many problems in this challenge is to have a very international team. So the team in Gothenburg uh, is um, containing 33 different nationalities. So we are talking of a pure, uh, only the, 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 the creative team of 120 people and around 200 people of the uh, design operation team. Uh, data modeling, uh, CID modeling, um, virtual reality, visualization. So around 350 people, roughly speaking, 33 nationalities and very young, very young uh, people, because we are obviously <clears throat> looking not at people like me as customer who are over 60 years old. We are looking at people globally who are much, much younger and have a different lifestyle, a different uh, uh, way of thinking, of, of adapting their lifestyle to the necessities uh, that are now existing globally. And therefore, um, this is the best recipe. And when it then comes down to specify, especially for the Chinese market, we have the, the studio in Shanghai that is mainly, I would say, 80% Chinese uh, colleagues and only 20% uh, percent then international background colleagues. But this helps us, of course, also to understand and not forget about the Chinese market. But the, the general, let's say, automatism to fulfill this challenge is to have a very young and international team and, and listen to all of them and, and listen, of course, also to our colleagues uh, in marketing and sales, in the uh, developing uh, markets, in the European market and in the Chinese market. So this feedback, of course, is for, is for us important as well. And there we are then afterwards trying to amalgate and to... To, to fusion uh, a global statement. And so far I have a very good feeling. Uh, the feedback I get from uh, especially uh, <clears throat> people I have been talking to, uh, investors, uh, future dealership owners in uh, South America, in Southeast Asia, Australia, Eastern uh, Europe, um, are all extremely positive about uh, Seeker and the design. So I think we are doing a good job. I think my first question for you is um, electrical cars are harder to design than ice cars for some reason or they look like the same for you? The, the problem is the other way around. I would love to differentiate the electric cars more than the uh, ice cars. But, and I get this question very often, why are you still, why? because they don't look so different. They don't look different, really. And um, the main reason is not so much the drivetrain. 
the package of the drivetrain. Um, the main reason why ICE cars and electric cars are not so different in the overall layout is the whole uh, subject of safety regulations um, around the car. I always make this fantastic example. You all know the car in Brazil as well, which is the Volkswagen bus from the 1950s and 60s. Great, a great object, a great design object. And you know the technical layout was the driver and the passenger were sitting on the front axle and then the legs and the, and the pedals <laughs> and the steering column was in front of the front axle. And then the, the air-cooled uh, uh, motor was behind the rear axle. So great weight distribution and you had a lot of space in between for loading, for people, whatsoever. And uh, if you would do such a car today, it would just not, it's not possible in the, in the, in the uh, safety regulations you have to fulfill, fulfill today. You, you have a front accident uh, and the people in the front are dead immediately because their feet are cut off, there is no uh, safety zone, there is um, there's nothing to protect the, 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 the driver and the passenger uh, because there is no safety zone in front of you. So whether you have a motor, a cooler, or battery, or whatever in front of you, you need to keep this safety zone. This is, then you have to fulfill the NCAP, especially in Europe, the NCAP five-star regulations, you have to uh, fulfill the safety regulations with regard to pedestrians and so on and so on. So you need something in front of the A-pillar and in, even in front of the front axle. And this is uh, explaining already to a big extent why the cars don't look so different and why we are not changing dramatically our layout, because you are right. I mean, the batteries are maybe in the floor, so you have uh, a lot of space in front of the front axle. Normally in the EV cars we do now uh, cooling uh, radiation, it's, it's very important, uh, cooling radiators. And then very often we do one thing which is different to the ice cars, we put the whole uh, box, the, the, the climate box uh, for air conditioning, heating and so on, we put it in front of the firewall. Uh, so we gain more space in the interior. And when you look into the interior of EV cars, normally they are more spacious. They have a bit more uh, air to breathe. Normally also under the center tunnel, there is some air, uh, some, some compartment or luggage compartment or little compartments to put cup holder and, and bags and stuff because we don't have a classic drivetrain from the motor to the rear axle. And uh, of course, this generates more space. And this is maybe the, the, the most significant difference in between uh, BEF and ICE cars. What we can expect for the design transiker for the future? Before I come to your specific uh, question, I, I do agree with you. Uh, when I came to uh, the Chile group and I visited China, I visited also the factories with my background from the Volkswagen group, especially Audi. As you know, I worked for many, many years with Audi, more than 20, 20 years. Um, and I was always related to the factories because what uh, the quality, the perceived quality, the factory and of course the supplier are able to deliver in the end. Um, also when I was in Bentley, the six years before I joined the, the Chile group, uh, the, the factory was always nearby. Whether it was in Audi in Ingolstadt, I just had to walk to the factory nearby or with Bentley it was very close. I was literally walking every day through the factory, sometimes also with VIP customer. And I, I think you only can deliver the best impression of a design when the perceived quality is delivered in the factory. If you do a nice design and the quality in the end is very bad, um, it is like you cook a very good meal that tastes fantastic, but uh, it's delivered and, and presented very ugly, then you can't appreciate it. it it's disturbing the taste in the end. So everything has to be perfect. And when I came into the factories in uh, Hangzhou Bay, for example, or in um, um, Ningbo or in Chengdu, I, whatever I've seen in the factories was really uh, fascinating me because it is uh, top end. If I look at the, at the big pressing uh, tools, the big pressing machines, 
they are uh, capsulated, you don't feel any vibrations, you don't he hear any noise. The factories are super clean. You know, you go to the toilet in the factory and you see the attitude of the people, how they deal with the perceived quality. It's a little bit like in a restaurant. The nicest restaurant, you go to the toilet and the toilet is dirty, then you get already a little bit of awkward feeling that the attitude of the people is not right. And um, the, the way of production is super modern. I mean, the people running around in the factory are literally guys in, in white suits with laptops. And if there is a problem on the um, assembly line, they uh, control it immediately digitally. And most of the work is done by robots. Yeah? This is incredible. I mean, wherever, in the spray boot, wheresoever. So that is for sure something which I appreciated a lot because I could see that the quality of design is supported by the de perceived quality delivered by the factory. This is the one statement uh, to your observation. What makes then Zika different to the, to the rest of the traditional car producer when there is not the difference, the big difference in the, in the overall package layout? I think we have a different idea how we cluster the portfolio. The portfolio, when we look at, especially at Audi or BMW or Volkswagen, um, the portfolio looks pretty much homogeneous. It is one family statement in these companies, in these traditional companies, but every family member looks pretty much the same. Yeah? So the Audi uh, A3, the Audi A4, A6, uh, A5, they're all pretty much looking very, very similar. We follow a different philosophy in the, in the Sika family, portfolio family. We uh, have different family groups. Uh, because we have also different model lines. We have the C line, which is attracting much younger customer, the M line, which is definitely attracting um, families, and then the Z line, this is the high-end uh, flagship line, where we attract older and more, uh, let's say, fluent uh, customer. And therefore, we also cluster the portfolio a little bit like in a real family. In a real family, the family members don't look like twins, except they are twins. But normally, you, you know, you look different than your son and your daughter looks different as the grandmother, but you feel a genetic code. You feel, ah, it's a family. You see them together and you feel, ah, they have a genetic code, but they are having their own character. And this is a more, from my point of view, modern uh, way to lay out the portfolio instead of doing this. We always called it Russian doll principle. You know, these Russian dolls. You open the Russian doll and then there's another Russian doll and another Russian doll and another Russian doll. And they all look the same. And I mean, to a certain period of time, um, I was even in Audi struggling sometimes on the Autobahn. Uh, is this now in my rear mirror Audi A4 or Audi A6? And this is what we definitely want to avoid. Um, of course, if you follow this principle that is more with the old, with the traditional car producer, you are putting a lot of highlight into the brand. So you push a lot the brand, but you don't push the individual product. In, especially China, the brand is not the most important thing. The most important thing for the customer is the product. And this is what they first, they want to have a very, for their customer group, a very individual product. And this is what we are delivering, tailor-made, more or less, for this group of people, also for the age of people, for the social kind of level uh, the people are in, uh, and make sure in the end that there is a, a, a genetic code. Especially, for, for example, when you go into the interior, first of all with the perceived quality, but when you go into the interior, a certain way of operating the car is always the same. The whole digital experience will be uh, always the same. So you feel at home in a seeker, you feel within the genetic code, as I say, without looking too similar all the time in every detail. Chinese clients uh, want the best product, not the brand. But uh, in other countries like Brazil, for example, uh, what's the main target uh, Zika search? Like Porsche, Audi, BMW, for example? Well, I think uh, Zika is definitely within the Chile uh, um, brands. 
the one that is going into the higher segment, into the premium and luxury segment. Um, this reflects also to a certain extent to the price. Nevertheless, I personally think the price is not over the top, uh, especially because Chinese customer, of course, are like every customer in the end of the day is looking after the best price for the, for the value. And uh, yeah, therefore, this is a little bit the, the, the direction Sika is aiming for. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's always the same. Every customer, not only in China, in the, in, all over the world, wants a good price, it wants a good value, a good uh, quality, uh, perceived quality, long-lasting quality, uh, you know, battery, uh, also to be reliable. The things are not broken after after a short while, so this is all uh, very very important, and and this is what is fulfilled. Uh, it's not only it looks it looks very re reliable and very high end perceived quality. It also acts. The cars act like this. I mean, this I'm driving a zero zero one in Gothenburg as a company car, and I mean there is to be honest there is no. There is no question open to me. There is no thing that where I say, "Wow, this is disappointing." So I'm quite happy with the re with the result of the overall product beyond the design. Stephen, uh, you told uh, you, you made a statement about twins and something like uh, everything is equal. Uh, for you, uh, the design of a car, it's global, a global car. It's global, or does it need adjustments according to the region of marketing of sale? Not answering your question immediately. Of course, you know there are adjustments anyway uh, for uh, certain markets when it comes down to legal, legis to legislational points. So where we have to change certain things uh, on behalf of legal requirements, for example, on the European market or also in the South American market. So that's one thing. That's but more, more uh, um, let's say, a technological thing. What we also do is we are, uh, in, we are changing a lot uh, in the markets when it comes down to CMF, to color and materials. There are markets that require more textile materials, different colors, for example, in Europe, uh, the German market uh, asks for a black car with black interior, as black as possible. This is normally not done in China because China wants something more uh, lively and more vivid. Uh, and therefore, we have speci specifications, for example, for the European market. But uh, I'm pretty sure sooner or later we will get feedback also from our colleagues from the developing markets uh, of Sika, what are the necessities, for example, in the Brazilian market. And the Brazilian market, as you know, is very important for us because it's one of the biggest markets in the world on cars and, and hopefully also one of the biggest markets for us after China, for Sika. And therefore, if there are, uh, from a marketing and sales point of view, necessities to adapt, especially in the things we can change easy, like uh, CMF colors, exterior colors, interior materials, interior colors. That is something that will be then specified for the market. Today we live in a connect connected era. So with uh, artificial intelligence, a lot of technology. <laughs> What's the main feature you see in the cars of the future? How will the desires of the Generation Z impact hair designs? Yeah, it's a good question. And of course, we, we discussed it also in the design team. We sometimes experiment a little bit with it. Um, I think you can even see in our portfolio a first um, glimpse of what might happen. It's still a very personal opinion. But when you look at the, the, the ambition, the, the car we have been developing together with Waymo, so this robo-taxi without a, 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 a human driver anymore, uh, and with this B-pillar-less uh, layout and package where you have these sliding doors, or it's not sliding, it's this kind of pivoting doors, where you enter the car without the B-pillar, um, this was a milestone for us, which ended up now also in the Sika mix, uh, which will be in the market now officially pretty soon. 
uh, it has been uh, already presented as a, as a concept car uh, in uh, the Beijing Motor Show and it will be shown later this year, obviously all kind of officially launched. And it gives the first glimpse um, what I personally think will happen in the future when you look at the uh, Generation C and uh, what are the expectations of young customer that are digital natives. It might happen that they are buying, a, if they buy a car or if they follow a kind of rental leasing model, whatsoever, they go not so much for a car as we over here uh, like a car, like me growing up as a petrol head with uh, beautiful cars in the late 60s, 70s, 80s. As a boy, you know, the Porsche and the Mercedes in my, in my home in Munich, uh, where I grew up. Um, um, this, this, this is a different world now, as you say. The, the, the world is much more triggered by the digital um, living circumstances and the digital uh, use cases. And therefore, this young customer or the next generation of customer might go for a for a vehicle, not even a car anymore, a vehicle, uh, a kind of um, iPod on wheels, where they enter, where they are driven most of the time autonomously and using this time more in the digital world than sitting behind the steering wheel and waiting in the traffic jam until you are back home in one hour and you spend one hour going to work and one hour going back or going to a restaurant or whatsoever with sitting behind the steering wheel in a traffic jam, which is a waste of money and time, especially lifetime. Yeah? People don't want to do this anymore. They don't want to waste their lifetime and, and just sitting uh, there. And they want to relax. They want to uh, enjoy different things, like a living room on wheels. So long story short, it might happen one day that the exterior design is not so important anymore. To be honest, when you buy a refrigerator or a washing machine or a dishwasher, the exterior is not the most important thing. It's more the brand, it's more the reliability, it's more the price to a certain extent. Uh, but you normally don't take your neighbor into your kitchen and, kitchen and say, wow, look at my new refrigerator. We still have shown our neighbors our new car. And, ah, look, my new car. But this might change. This might change. The young customer will say, this is a product on wheels. The exterior is not so important. For me, it's important. What do I get in the interior? What is the atmosphere, the living room, whatsoever atmosphere, lounge atmosphere? What are the gadgets? Is there a refrigerator? Can I have a, a cool drink inside, a water? Can I heat the, the, the bottle for the baby or the little food uh, glass for the baby? Can I, can I have a little supplier for uh, towels where I can clean my hands, where I can relax? Good music, being able to uh, uh, completely exchange on the digital level uh, without getting disturbed. And then when I arrive, I, I get out of the thing and the thing go goes away. It, I, I don't have to park the, the thing. I don't have to go to the parking lot and walk back home in the rain or whatsoever. The thing just goes away and when I need it, I, I call it with the app and then it arrives again. This is my personal vision to the future. The question is when it's going to happen. It's all dependent, of course, on the... It's not so much the problem of the technical abilities. You know, you can do a lot of things already, especially in China. I've seen use cases where people have been singing karaoke on the motorway and the driver was just in between triggering the steering wheel. They were already driving autonomously. The big issue is still the legal uh, layouts. Yeah? What's happening, what can be not detected, things that are not foreseeable yet. In the city, a, a, a kid that's running on the street or, or, or a bicycle rider, which cannot be detected early enough. Or then, if something goes wrong, who is who is uh, who is in the in the end uh, legally responsible? Is it the the car producer? Is it the owner, driver? Who is it in the end when somebody dies? Yeah? Which is the worst case scenario? Huh? That is the worst case scenario. Nobody wants to be responsible for uh, killing a person. Yeah? 
And this is, I think, the biggest issue yet. If this is taken out in a way and solved, also from a legal point of view, then uh, I think it will happen very fast because technology is already pretty far on that one. 30 years of designing cars is a lot of time. So what motivated you to be a car designer at the first time? Yeah, it's, it's quite funny because I was, um, as I said, I was growing up in a family business in Munich in the 1960s. I was born in 1962. So I grew up in the 1960s and 70s in this family business, which had nothing to do with cars. But I was always very, very interested in, in, in fine arts. Funny enough, I was always uh, painting and drawing and sketching. And yeah, so that was one thing. And the other thing was um, cars. I always was very interested in cars. I didn't bring this together, to be honest, in the beginning that this that there exists even a, a profession called uh, car design. So uh, when I got older and made my high school diploma, I was, of course, uh, more and more involved to yeah, what to do. I had a little bit of a pause in between because I was joining the military service in Germany. So that gave me two years of thinking time. And during this time, I found out that there is... Um, a possibility to, to study something which is called design. I didn't know that. So 1982, I started to, to study design in the Munich uh, College of Design. Uh, it was at that time almost very difficult to explain to people, the family, what is it? What are you doing over there? What is this all about? Um, so it was not so fashionable at that time. Today, everybody is a designer, even those guys who are doing uh, 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 bobbing, bobbing uh, trousers or swimming trousers are design. Everybody is a designer. But at that time, nobody was a designer. So it was very difficult to explain what, what are you doing? What are you studying? And it was funny. Uh, during my studies, I realized then that because I was focused on product design, that there is, of course, the possibility to also, as a product, to design cars, which was uh, very rare in Germany at that time. Funny enough, Germany has a car industry, so a lot of famous car designers at that time were from the UK, from the United States, from everywhere else. And um, But then I got very quickly into uh, contact, of course, Munich with BMW and with Audi, and I started an internship in the end with Audi as a young student, and they uh, supported me a lot. Um, and I found this really very satisfying to, to my love for car and my love for, for doing art, to bring this together. And then um, Audi gave me the chance after my um, graduation at the Munich Design University to do a two-year uh, master degree course at the Royal College of Art in London at the end of the 80s, and they sponsored me as well. They sponsored one student per year. This was a program Audi was doing at that time to get more German students into car design. And there was only the chance at that time to study at the Royal College of Art or at the Art Center in Pasadena in, in Los Angeles. And um, I had, to be honest, I had the choice, but I wanted to go for, for London. And it was a fantastic decision. It was a mind blower in many respects for me. Uh, and I, I learned so, so much over there. And it was very satisfying, very demanding as well. And then, yeah, after the uh, degree uh, in, in uh, London at the Royal College of Art, as you know, I worked many, many years with Audi. Uh, also to show my gratitude for all this support. And I was always following this principle. I always supported students. I still We still do this today. We do projects with Royal College of Art, with um, <laughs> the Hangzhou uh, University of Art. So in all kinds of countries, we are in contact with uh, universities and with students. We do a lot of possibilities for students also in the studios, in both studios. Uh, to have uh, internships. So we, I, I try to follow this tradition and always give young people the chance to make this experience as well and get the chance in the end of the day and also some support. And yeah, come back to your question. Um, 
it was not uh, because there are guys who have been starting sketching cars when they're three years old. It was not really my. I was a little bit stepping in from the side because my main focus was first of all fine art and design, product design, and then I started to get into cars. So it was a bit a late a late starter, <laughs> but it worked out in the end. Uh, the last one. What can Brazilian consumers expect from Zeker? What's the main feeling when they get in and drive? Well, of course, my counter question is why should Brazilian uh, customer expect something different than customers in other parts of the world? That's that's my question. I mean, unfortunately, I can't I can't install a Caipirinha uh, spender in the car. <laughs> that would fulfill maybe the the interest of a Brazilian uh, customer or. Uh, but, but you know what I mean, I'm joking. Um, the question is really what do you do specific in a global product? I think beyond the perceived quality, uh, you, you expect also as a Brazilian customer, you are um, you are getting, I think, maybe uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, specific CMF layouts uh, that are fulfilling the demands of, uh, of, of or the, the expectation of Brazilian customers. Sometimes, you know, it depends also a little bit on the road qualities, uh, maybe some work on the suspension, either it's softer or harder, or the range is a bit different. Uh, wheel sizes, I personally as a designer like big wheel sizes, but when you come to comfort, you have to maybe offer not only 20, 21 inch wheels, but maybe also only 19 inch wheels that are better for comfort in certain parts of countries that ha have still certain demands yeah, on, on this kind of suspension and, quality, and comfort uh, qualities. Yeah, but this is it. So as I say, uh, from a design point of view, the only differentiation will be CMF. Thank you very much.